everybody, and welcome back to our series of companion guides to the Wheel of Time. Make sure to check out all of the previous videos in this series for a complete breakdown of how these videos are formatted, but here's the quick and dirty. The first section is going to be a spoiler-free section that is just a recap of the chapter, and it'll have some maps and things like that. New readers are not going to be spoiled. In fact, it's designed for you. So if you just read it and you want to go back and figure out what you just read and see some more details, this is the place for that. The second section is going to be totally spoiler filled. Do not watch that unless you have completely finished all the books because we're going to get into the foreshadowing, all the information, breakdowns of the characters, stuff that happens way in the future that we can kind of see the seeds of now. All of that is there. That's designed for people rereading the series. So I'll throw a spoiler warning up before we get to that section. But let's go ahead and jump right in. Quick thank you, though, to this video series sponsor, Audible.com, but more on them later. They do have a very special offer for my viewers. You can get a free audiobook. Just click the link in the description or stay tuned until later to hear more about that. So let's go ahead and get into the recap of Chapter 3 of Eye of the World, titled The Peddler. The chapter opens with the peddler's wagon crossing the wagon bridge in the Emmons Field Green and stopping in front of the Winespring Inn. At the arrival of the peddler, many villagers, including the village council, crowd around the wagon to hear news and purchase goods. Rand and Matt file in behind the village council, and they're joined by their friend Perrin Abara. Now, the crowd demands the peddler, named Padon Fane, to give them information about the outside world. Fane keeps the crowd waiting, fiddling around with small tasks on his wagon to build tension and build excitement. He's clearly reveling in this. Now, eventually, he stands and speaks, telling the villagers of Emmons Field that there are wars in Gildon with a man that claims to be the dragon reborn, and he tells of Aes Sedai being dispatched to capture him as he can channel the One Power. Now, the village council and the mayor, Bran Alvir, are very alarmed of the talk of war and false dragons, and they ask Fane to come into the inn to speak privately. Fane agrees, and then the men disappear into the inn, and the rest of the crowd disperses. But Rand, Matt, and Perrin remain and begin talking about the news of the false dragon and the war. Now, Matt tells them that he heard from a merchant guard once that the dragon would be reborn in the hour of greatest need to battle the Dark One. But Rand and Matt are very skeptical of this, and they begin to debate about whether or not naming the Dark One is bad and whether Aes Sedai are all dark friends. They are interrupted by Nynaeve Almira, the village wisdom, and Egwene Alvir, the mayor's daughter who's also the apprentice to Nynaeve. Nynaeve demands to know what has them talking about things like this as she wasn't there for the arrival of the peddler, and when they tell her all the things that Fane said, she says that the village council is probably asking all of the wrong questions and that this should be women's circles business and marches right on into the inn to do her own questioning. Now this leaves Rand and Egwene a chance to speak, and Rand asks Egwene if she will dance with him tomorrow during bell time. She tells him that in the afternoon she will, as she's going to be busy in the morning, and then shows Rand her hair now in a braid. Now, this signifies that she's of marrying age, despite being a few years younger than Rand. In the morning, all of the unmarried women will be dancing around the Beltine pole, meaning that Egwene will be there, and she's technically a unmarried woman now. Now, Rand is taken aback at this because they have been told by everybody that they're going to be getting married, and now that Egwene is of marrying age, he feels that pressure. So he tells her that just because someone is old enough to marry doesn't mean that they should, and Egwene surprises Rand by saying that she agrees, and that doesn't mean that they should ever get married. She goes on to say that she might become the wisdom and that Nynaeve says she can be taught to listen to the wind and that wisdoms seldom marry. She goes on to say that she would like to move out of the two rivers and see places, and they have a small argument about that being foolish. They are interrupted as Matt and Perrin rejoin the conversation, and Perrin has received a coin from Moraine as well, and he also saw the Black Rider that both Matt and Rand had seen earlier. Perrin says that he saw the rider at the edge of town staring at the smithy while he worked. When he told Master Luhan, the blacksmith, he didn't believe him. Rand tells Perrin that he believes him, and Egwene demands to know what's going on. Perrin and Matt explain about the rider, and Egwene tells them that they are all being foolish and spreading dumb tales. They are interrupted, though, as a man in shaggy white hair busts out of the inn, and the chapter ends. So that's it for the recap of Chapter 3. We're going to move on to the spoiler-filled section now, so let's go ahead and throw up another spoiler warning. The rest of the video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red, meaning there will be major plot spoilers, and they're going to run all the way up through the final book in the series, A Memory of Light. Watch at your own risk. So let's talk about the foreshadowing first. Early in the chapter, Rand thinks about how Pot Fane first took interest in him, Matt, and Perrin the year before. 
He interprets this as them becoming men now, and so Fane will interact with them. But really, we later find out that it's Pot and Fane was looking for a boys of their particular age, and they happened to fit, which is why he took an interest. Another small piece of foreshadowing here is the mentioning of wolves. Now, you've heard wolves mentioned a number of times. This obviously isn't the first time in the story so far, but they've all been mentioned in very menacing ways. They're described as coming out of the mountains and killing farm animals, attacking travelers and other humans. This appears to be setting up Perrin and Egwene's encounter with the wolves later. Robert Jordan is setting the wolves up to be menacing and terrifying, only to later to flip the script and have them be friendly protagonists when Perrin discovers he can speak with them. Another small piece of foreshadowing here is that Egwene tells Rand that Nynaeve says she can learn to listen to the wind. Now, obviously, we know that this means she can learn to channel the one power, but neither Nynaeve nor Egwene are aware of this. This is Nynaeve being able to feel the ability to channel within Egwene, even though neither of them really truly knows what they're talking about or what that is. Let's also hit some general observations from the chapter that I think are interesting. The first is, again, the general misinformation that these people have and that they base their belief systems on. When Pot on Fane mentions someone claiming to be the Dragon Reborn, people exclaim that the Dark One is loose and all other th bunches of things that are just flat out nonsense. I think this is easy just to laugh away at how misinformed these people are, but the reality is, is that this is totally analogous to our current lives and current events. The people of the two rivers have been deprived of education and reliable information as they're in really a remote rural area. Not all of them have critical thinking ability or knowledge of to know what's true and what's myth in regards to traditions and belief. I think that this makes a lot of sense as we have these issues now and we live in an era of instant communication and information at our fingertips. And we still have people that don't know necessarily the truth of things. The lack of critical thinking ability is pretty common among people. So I actually love that this scene's in there. I originally, when I first read it, thought that it's really dumb that these people don't know stuff. But in reality, I think it's real. Also for general thoughts, we get our first interaction between Egwene and Rand in this chapter. And I think it really sets the tone for the rest of the books. First, they are both aware of the assumed marriage that they're going to have. But neither of them seems to be totally into it. Rand seems to try to avoid any commitment, and Egwene is more interested in pursuing her own interests and adventures rather than settling down, which again is fairly consistent to her character arc. But I think most importantly is the way they treat each other, and I think you see this throughout the books. First, Rand essentially tells Egwene or assumes that he knows what Egwene will want, but calling her crazy for saying that she wanted to leave the two rivers and being flabbergasted that she would even consider it. It's part of the borderline toxic masculinity attitude that many of the Two Rivers men express in that he doesn't truly want Egwene to have agency. He just wants her to do what she's supposed to do. And then he feels as though he needs to protect her from herself. Something that you're going to see common, that, that the men of the Two Rivers need to protect the women from themselves. Now, this is balanced by the way that Egwene treats Rand now and later in the books. You see it here first, though. When she finds out that they've all seen this black rider and they're all terrified by it, she completely discounts them as stupid and idiotic and speaks very condescendingly towards Rand as he could not possibly have seen what he thinks he saw. She completely ignores his experience as inferior to her own because she didn't have it. Now, I know this seems like mincing words here, but this is exactly what she does later to Rand and Matt in the books, and I think it's why some people dislike her. She actually does this to Rand when he tells her that he's going to break the seals. She immediately assumes that he's crazy and can't possibly know what he's doing, rather than asking him how he came to that conclusion. She discounts his information and his experiences as inferior to her own. Anyways, I think this is an interesting characterization and in how it just kind of continues from here in the books, and how they're both very flawed characters, and that's actually why I love both of them. For unanswered questions in the book, I think the main one here is, did Pot on Fane know the previous year that Rand, Matt, and Perrin were the boys that he was looking for when he came to the Two Rivers and Rand says he started taking notice of them? And if he did know it was them a year ago, why did the Shadow take so long to act? And if he was not aware, how did the Merdral that arrived before Fane know to look specifically for them? So I, I really have no idea actually to the answer to that. I think it is kind of one of those things that might be a small plot hole. What do you guys think? 
Make sure to let me know what you think of that question and the rest of the chapter in the comments of this video, and certainly check out Audible to get a free audiobook. If you head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus, they're going to give you a free audiobook that you can keep regardless of whether or not you actually get their service or not, and it helps support thegreatblight.com. All of the audiobook versions of The Wheel of Time are absolutely outstanding, so this is a great opportunity. Take advantage of it. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to see all of the Wheel of Time content I make. That's all I do here, so make sure to subscribe. Depending on when you are watching this, there will be a video like this for each chapter of the book, so make sure to watch the entire playlist if you want to get recaps of the whole book and all of the new maps. Thanks for watching, everybody, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?